Wonderful. Welcome to Freedom Park. I'm Israel Haas. I'm the uh, the executive director here, and and I have been here for a couple of years. We're really excited that you're here and get to experience what we experience every single day. And um, you're just to just to let you know if people all of a sudden go <gasps> or are distracted, don't seem to be paying attention. It might be because there's a couple of eagles that are battling right here. It happens a lot through this window. It's hard to have staff meetings back here. At we're, we're usually up and down. Whoa, look at that. Oh, man, the trumpeters. Oh, there's a lot of stuff that happens uh, outside this window. Uh, and we want to have even more happening outside the window because, uh, and that's why the bluff is so important for us. And we have right here a globally rare bluff prairie. And that's why we're hosting this native, growing native plants for pollinators, because it's part of what we do here. And it's a really critical piece of what we can do in this small park to have a big impact um, that can literally reverberate around the world. We have 16,000 visitors in a typical year that come from all over the world, uh, over 50 countries and every state uh, come here to this bluff. And so what we want to do here uh, at this park is create a special space for people to learn about how important it is to cultivate environments, habitats for pollinators. Pollinators, migratory birds, others. We're focusing on uh, more of the insects and the plants here today. But um, we, as part of uh, what we do here at Freedom Park, uh, we're committed to connecting people to life at the confluence in lots of different ways uh, through history and nature and programs. Um, like this, uh, we do have our, our new our new newsletter is going to be coming uh, in print any time here. It's been posted for a couple weeks online, but this is our last year. And uh, if you haven't seen this newsletter, feel free to pick it up because uh, there's a cool before and after photo of the bluff before the goats came as part of our restoration effort to create these habitats for native plants. Um, and this is just in top secret, top secret, I'm just telling it, sharing it with you. It's going to be over by the time that this recording goes live. Okay, uh, next week the fire department is planning to burn part of the bluff. That's where the magic happens and you'll probably hear me hear a little bit about that as we talk about native plants. You're hopefully not going to be burning too much in your front yards if you just have a little <laughs> tiny plot. They get in trouble for that. But we are working with the fire department on the first ever um, controlled burn on this bluff to hopefully open up some seeds and create some magic here on the bluff um, as we, as we uh, extend our pollinator gardens from up here. Maybe you saw them when you're coming in. That's our native plant, our native prairie plant area. We want to spread that right down along this whole bluff. So we're really happy you're here, and I could talk a long time about where we're going in Freedom Park, but that just kind of gives you a little overview. We'd love for you to stay in touch with us, connect with us on Facebook. Uh, uh, if you're not on social media, we'd love to send newsletters and print and keep you informed about things that are happening here, like these programs, um, and other ways that you can be involved. We'd love to have you contribute to this. This is a big effort. Bluff, saving the bluff, is... Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. We've got about a $70,000 project that we're working on over nine years. We'd love your help with that. Um, so with that, I want to give it over oh, to Kathy and Jorg Sweeney. Can we just give a round of applause to them? Uh, and I will let them introduce themselves. I have the pleasure of serving with Kathy on some uh, Great River Road efforts. Uh, but we also are excited uh, to partner on pollinators, which we very much love. So I'll thank let you guys you so introduce much, yourselves, and thank you so much for You're being welcome. here You're welcome. Thank you so much. Well, Jorg and I are so happy to be here with you today. Um, we, uh, we have really fallen in love with this place since we moved down to Stockholm, Kevin. We live halfway between the two towns. About uh, We moved down about four years ago. And um, we love to come here because, as Israel just outlined, there's so many great things going on here at the confluence. And so we um, have committed to volunteering here to be a part of what uh, the magic is here at the at the center. 
And uh, what we're going to be sharing with you today is some of our own learning that we've done as we've been um, understanding and learning how to become native plant growers. I'll just give you a little bit of background on our work. Um, <clears throat> we, um, we started out going through master gardening training program at the University of Minnesota. And um, we did master gardening work for 25 years. And we learned, us, we learned so many wonderful things there. And we really appreciate the master gardening program a lot. Um, and then as Yor got more and more into beekeeping, um, and as we became more aware of all the challenges that pollinators are having, we've, we've really switched our gardening practice over to native plants. And when we started doing that, um, there wasn't nearly as much known about it as there is now. And I'll just say that um, in, the, in this area of Minnesota and Wisconsin, there are some really great resources available to help all of us who wish to do this. And the state of Minnesota also is doing some fabulous work with their, um, with their grant program for homeowners to help people turn their lawns and their property into pollinator-friendly spaces. So <clears throat> it's a great time to be in this learning process. And um, I'll just say, too, that we've got an hour today, but we're going to be sticking around afterwards. We'll be available to you, as Israel already said, afterwards. If you have questions for us, you'll be able to reach us. And um, last year, we went through Wisconsin's Master Naturalist Training Program. And if you're, if you're not familiar with that, that's a program Wisconsin does. I think all the states do it, but um, we live in Wisconsin now, so we went through it here. And... The site we went through training at was Beaver Creek Reserve, which is near Eau Claire. And um, I'd never heard of Beaver Creek Reserve before. And it's just a marvelous, marvelous resource for all of us who live in this area. And um, they have many classes, many activities, like Israel has here. Um, and uh, the same type of natural science focus, certainly not in the confluence of the rivers like it is here. But um, it's a great resource, and um, in your resource handout that we gave you, I think the first um, item on the list is Beaver Creek Reserve. Mm -hmm. And they do have an incredible native plant sale that uh, is available to all of us who uh, are interested in signing up for it. So as you get to the point where um, if you're looking for plants this year, um, you'll be able to go on their site, look at what's available, and then a register to buy plants from them and then pick those up the first week in May. So already um, excited about that. Um, we're going to start out today then, because as I said, we'll, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll be ending at three, so we have a lot of material to go through. And basically what we're doing is amplifying what's already in this book, Nature's Best Hope, by Doug Tallamy. Um, Doug Tallamy is an entomologist and he's a scientist who studies insects, and he's become very well known because he and um, the, the, uh, the um, Audubon Society and the National Wildlife Federation have been working on really getting the word out in the country about how to help pollinators. Doug Tallamy is, uh, he, he knows more about insects and more about native plants probably than anybody in the country. And then when he's got these great partner organizations to work with, he's been able to take what he knows and get it translated into everyday language. And also get it translated into everybody can do something. And his idea is that together we can build our own homegrown national park. And the idea is <laughs> that if each of us contributes to planting native plants, whether that's in our pots, on our decks, whether that's our yard, whether that's an acreage, everybody can do something. And that's a very powerful way to start, we think. So that's what we'll be focusing on today, is his 10 um, ideas. And he has a website, so you can be sure that after today's presentation, if you're interested in learning any more uh, about Doug Tallamy, and you want to look into any dimension of this, there's a lot of really good information available. So we'll start out today by acknowledging that um, where we are today, yeah, <coughs> excuse me, was is a part of uh, the uh, 
the Wisconsin First Nations land. This is a map that uh, illustrates what some of the different nations are, the Native American um, areas of the state that were uh, where people lived and were stewards of the land for thousands and thousands of years before European settlement. And um, in Wisconsin and in Minnesota, we have uh, a wealth of Native American um, tribal legacy that we're building on. And many of the tribal nations have their own work underway right now to restore and to rejuvenate um, Native uh, plants and Native, uh, as well as Native culture. So we're really, um, we're really happy that we, we have that, um, that background to build on. <coughs> Again, we're talking about planting Native plants for pollinators today. Ten steps you can take. And we're really focusing on Doug Tallamy and the Homegrown National Park um, movement. We took this picture at Smiling Pelican Bakery in Maiden Rock, if, if any of you have ever been there. Mm -hmm. Oh, not only is it such a great bakery, right? Um, but uh, they have such a beautiful garden. And um, they, uh, they really do a great job of having native plants um, on display there. Okay, again, just to tell you what we're going to be talking about today, it is this. Um, and I, what I really want to um, leave you with before your takes on and tells you more about the 10 steps is this idea that each of us can contribute individually and collectively because there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing that's too small to start with and we can build um, all the way up from there. So with that, um, with that positive thought, I'm going to let your take over. Oh, thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. And thanks for the great introduction, uh, Israel. Um, so we, <clears throat> we, were, we ran through this this morning, and because I love this subject so much, Kathy told me, I know in certain terms, you have to cut back. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see Kathy over there, I said, give me the signal. So if she's going to go, if I'm getting too far afield, she'll let me know. So I got the timer here. on you. Exactly. <laughs> So, to, what we are going to talk about today is, is what, what we can do, the 10 steps, that Doug Tallamy in his book, Nation's Best Hope, says that, that we can do to help restore the biodiversity that is really disappearing quickly. I mean, we've got monocultures, we've got urban areas, we've got everything, culture, uh, agriculture that's, that's just taken over. We're planting all kinds of plants that really don't contribute anything to our plant diversity. Um, everything comes from somewhere but not everything belongs everywhere. I mean, there are places where you can put plants that are just fine, and other places where they just don't belong, because they don't contribute anything to the uh, environment. Now, one of the things that, that is beautiful about this place is, and, and um, is a good starting point as an example, Israel and, and crew have just started this prairie garden out there, which is fantastic, which is exactly the sort of thing that we want people to do here. Now, if we had 10 of those spread around here in the neighborhood, it'd be a little oasis for a lot of different, different kinds of plants. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, is creating those kinds of oases and corridors. If you don't have the oases where, they can, uh, where, the, where the animals can rest and breed and feed and feel safe, then you're not, you're not going to have any uh, plant diversity or, or animal diversity at all. And if you don't have the corridors between, then you're going to become isolated, and then you have a problem too, because then you get genetic issues. If you've only got 10 of one kind in, in one place, and they'll go anywhere, they'll die out. So we want them to be able to move. This is, we know this from the monarch situation. Everybody knows the monarch situation. Um, all those corridors that have been created. We want to do the same thing, but we want to do it. And Doug wants us to do it for all species, for many more species than just the monarch. So in order to do that, we have to create diversified uh, environments. Now let's take a look at this picture. <clears throat> this is a, a classic uh, mid-Atlantic mid uh, perfect landscape. You can see there's the Bradford pears, which are very pretty when they're blooming. They do smell bad. The, uh, the Bradford pear gro grows very quickly. It's imported from Asia. Um, it uh, tends to break pretty easily in a high wind. So it's 
really not a very good thing. And there's no insects at all that other than maybe a little nectar. But other than that, they, there's no use for this tree. It provides nothing. If you look underneath those trees, there's only grass. Lawns are the least productive of all the environment other than a desert. Because all there is is grass there. There's nothing else. And in order to maintain lawn, what we have to do? We have to cut it, fertilize it, water it. We have to keep every, we have, there's a lot of input to keeping that lawn looking just so. And of course, all those chemicals run off into our water. A lot of, it tends to be overuse. So, we don't have any insects in this environment because we don't have any insects. There are no birds. Birds need to have those insects and larvae so that they can feed their young. So, as far as wildlife is concerned, this is a desert. There is nothing there. We have, <clears throat> Doug is trying to figure out how can we enhance that. How, where can we get more land? Because our private, or our public lands are limited and we've used them up. I mean, we've got a whole bunch of 50, 52 million of national parks and the, all the public lands are, are uh, being used now already. So the only place that we can go is to get private users, private landowners to turn over some of the land and create these oases and corridors that we were talking about. It's estimated there are 40 million acres of lawn in this country, and each year there's another 500 square miles of lawn added. So we're losing that. And 83% of the land in the lower states is privately owned. So we have to go and get, get private landowners to support this process. So we have to do that, and that's why we're here. That's why you're here. They're interested in figuring out how can we create diversity. So this is step one. Shrink your lawn. Shrink it by half. If we shrink, if everybody shrunk their their lawn by one half, you would have 20 million acres, which is about 40 percent of the, all the national parks in the country. So that would be quite, a, quite an achievement. So step two: replace non-native with natives. Well, everything is a native somewhere. Asia has got a lot of native plants, so we bring them over here because they're pretty. Well, because they solved some problem. Kudzu was brought over because we're trying to get erosion. Phragmites was brought over as a packing material. We have uh, a garlic mustard because it was used as an, as an herb or a, a buckthorn, this nightshade tree, same with Russian olives. All of those things were brought to this country and none of them are being used by insects or anything local. So they just keep going. There's nothing to keep them in check other than people ripping them out or poisoning them. The native plants, they go into an environment where they belong. You don't need to control them. You don't need to fertilize them. You may need to water them if there's an extreme drought, but in general you really don't have to look after them and they do just fine. And there's a plant for every niche in our ecosystem. For, for the, for the for, so we can have beautiful plants all year round, they bloom, and for every corner of our property. And the beauty of it, of course, is that we have all those insects then that go and live them because they eat those plants. They live in those plants, they live in the duff. They live in and understand those plants. There's nothing that eats a brat for pear. So, the other thing about <coughs> about native plants is it encourages the, uh, the insects, which we were talking about, who are the most efficient uh, producers of animal protein from animals. I mean, we have cows and horses and so forth, that, but the insects are by far, by far the biggest workhorses in changing protein, the plant protein into animal protein. So we give them a place to live and they will um, take care of it. Now, we're talking about native plants, and one of the things that Ptolemy found was that not all plants are equal. Um, some, even native plants, I mean, daylily has actually zero other than a little bit of nectar. There has no insects at all that attack daylilies. Um, and, but we have some plants that are used by hundreds, literally hundreds of, of uh, moss. His study was on Lepidoptera, which is butterflies and moss. 
And those key plants, or those keystone plants, represent 5% uh, of all the plants, but they, in fact, support 75% of the Lepidoptera. So if you get one of those, and the other thing that happens is if the keystone plant is not present, the, it is a very good chance that that, envi that the environment will, that ecosystem will die, or at least be greatly, greatly degraded. The, the plant really needs to be there to support all, everything else that's going on around it. So, where I'm going to talk about specifically some of the keystone plants specific to this zip code. Um, you can find that on uh, National Wildlife. National Wildlife Federation and um, National Audubon Society are they're both on your resource um, list there, and they both give you um, the opportunity to put in your zip code, and then they'll print out for you what the um, keystone plants are in your zip code. Yeah, and, all, and the other plants, and also give you the information on the kind of uh, uh, plantings that, that they like. So, we're gonna, I'm going to talk quickly about some of these, and some of them actually have surprised me a little. So we're going to go to the first one. Well, oak tree turns out to be the most productive plant that we have in, in an environment. In our environment, there are 389 different Lepidoptera or insects, butterflies and moths, that use the oak in one way or another. In out east, where, uh, where in Maryland, where uh, Ptolemy's from, he had over 500 Lepidoptera. Now, the way he found these things out was he had his grad students go out and watch the trees. And he, they identified all the different kinds of pig, bugs that came in, and insects that came and looked at and used it in some way, shape, or form. So all of these are based upon that. And, he's, and as Kathleen said, he's working closely with National Wildlife, Audubon, and a number of other groups um, to find that to uh, find out what some of the other plants are. It, it's a, these can be fast growers. They can be 20 feet tall in 15 years. So they can be pretty good. Um, I've always thought of oak as being a, a slow grower, and then Doug, Doug showed me a plant, or he, should, he showed a video of a plant as, as a little girl, and then as she grew taller, she got about this tall, and the plant was, the oak was, you know, 30 feet above her. It was pretty amazing. The next, <clears throat> this one surprised me, was the willow. That's what we have there. 380. 380 different Lepidoptera, in some way, use. you can see the bee on the, on the right-hand picture there. The beauty of the, the willow is it blooms really early. And again, because it's, it's synchronized, uh, it, it, it's evolved in a way so that it, it, a lot, it catches all of the early insects that come out. So now all these early insects are going there and the, take, pick up the pollen and move it around from, from one plant to another. There's also a little bit of nectar in there to attract those plants. So the willow and those insects, they pull up together. They complement each other. And they're always taking advantage of that. So there's a lot of them, especially in the spring. They don't have a lot of other choice. Choke cherry, black cherry. They have some really pretty flowers. I really like those. Um, 377. That's a pretty amazing thing. <coughs> the, the, all these numbers are on the back of your handouts as well. So. That's a local. And um, you will be able to get this PowerPoint as well. We'll email it to you. Israel has your contact info, so you'll all get that and anything else. In our question and answer session, if there's other specifics that you mm -hmm. want us to um, email, we'll, we'll take, take note of that and send that to you. So you know you can get this. Aren't the, isn't the choke cherry toxic to horses? I don't know that. I believe it is. Okay. They are. So well, I, I, again, like with any of these things, if you careful what I mean, you need to know where you're planting, right. and and the, the, the issues that are with that. You obviously don't. I mean, there might be some things that are very pretty, but you definitely don't want them around your house, for example. But it's, it's like when I when I teach my beekeeping classes, and 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 I talk about wasps, and people, oh, I'll get rid of wasps, and it's like, well, if they're right in your house or close by, and they're causing a problem, yeah, you can get rid of them. But if you see them out there in the field, leave them. They eat so many bugs and larvae and keep your garden, uh, keep down the pests in your garden. It's really a, it's really a good thing to have. And uh, until August when they run out of food and 
you're all having a picnic. Pretty much leave you alone. <laughs> so it's a birch, box elder, and maple. Now, I really love the maple. I mean, they were beautiful. The sugar maple is just stunning. Box elder, of course, it's it's kind of a nuisance. I mean, people think of it as being a nuisance, but it it has incredible. Uh, uh, instant <coughs> support. So again, you know, leave it if it's there. It's not going to cause a problem, not going to fall in your house or, or cause an issue. Leave them there. I wouldn't necessarily want to plant one. I'd plant a maple, but I wouldn't really want to plant one. <laughs> uh, in my yard. I like high, high bush cranberry. I, I, in the fall, it's just stunning. Um, I have I have uh, always admired that. The, the beautiful colors on it gets to be sort of this rosy color to a deep purple. Uh, mm. So it has, it has a wonderful color. One of the things that you'll notice as we're going through this list of plants is that they're just as beautiful as anything we import. And, and we don't need to take care of them. I mean, they will take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. They won't be eaten by anything. They, I mean, they, they have their own defenses, so whatever's here. And if you see a few, the other thing about these things is if you see a few leaves in the hole, holes in the leaves, don't worry about it. They, the plants can take an awful lot of damage because they're used to that. They're used to insects coming in and biting off chunks of their leaves. As long as there's less than 50% in that neighborhood, they should be just fine. Obviously, if it gets to be more than something is wrong, the plant is not healthy, there's something going on in the environment, I probably should try and check it out. So goldenrod, now, I like goldenrod in fall, it's particular, but in August, it, it's really beautiful and showy and now the problem that I have, we have a couple of acres, and one of those acres is completely overgrown. There's nothing else grows there. So I did find, though, that if I mow over it a couple of times, it does, it does stay down. And I'm getting, starting to get clover and other things growing up through it. So now this, this fall, I've got, this spring, I'm going to, in the next week or so, I'm going to be going out and spreading some prairie seeds out there. Um, to hopefully that, that'll get something else started. I want to have something more than just... You know, one acre of, of golden but I want some other things to be there. I want to have some monarchs. I want to have different kinds of, of plants. But 102 is an astonishing number for, for an herbaceous plant. I love wild strawberry. 68, it's a good number. We use that as a ground cover. We started, we started out with a couple of plants. And we put them around, and we put them around our roses, and we put them around some of the things that grow taller. They only get about that tall, they spread out. So they make a really nice ground cover. It keeps the ground cool, uh, it keeps it keeps the things moist, and they're and they'll just and they're easy to control. They start to take over, you just rip them out, and they don't come back. So I really like wild strawberry for, for that. Plus you get all those lovely berries if you can get them before the, the critters do. Joe Pieweed, love old Joe Pieweed. It's so colorful and it, you can see it from anywhere. You're driving along the road. It's a patch of Joe Pye. It's just, it's just gorgeous. Huh. It's to be really tall. Can be really tall. While you're on Joe Pye, I have a question. I planted that in my daughter's garden, and it moves. It travels. It's not where I originally put it. It's over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe Pye does spread. Uh -huh. um, so I think one of the things that happens with a lot of these plants is they're they're adaptive. So if 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 you plant it over here and it doesn't like it, it'll, it'll gradually move over to a place where it likes it better. Oh, okay. You know, and then it'll kind of die off. <laughs> you know? I mean, we see the same thing happening with our lawns. So, I mean, they start over here and then they gradually move around and die off. Okay. At least that's my theory. Now, back to you, Beautiful plant. Um, again, look at the colors on that and the, and the textures. This is as good as I think we can get from somewhere else. Let's use these instead. Plus, which they, uh, I believe that, that they're legumes, so they put nitrogen back in the soil. So these are a good one to enrich the soil as well. Wild geranium, crate in the shade. They're pro pro profuse. They keep blooming for a long time. A little pink brightness in the shade. Brown eyed Susan, great for sun, dry spots. They're, again, they're, they're clumpy and they will spread out, but again, they're very easy to control. If they get too much, you can just split them up and put some somewhere else. Milkweeds. Oh, with the famous milkweed. Whenever we see milkweed now, we think, of course, automatically of the monarch butterflies. 
And it doesn't matter what kind of milkweed. They, I mean, monarchs have particular ones that they like better, but plant them. It, it doesn't matter. They'll, they'll find it and they'll use it. But again, plant more of them. Monarda, butterflies, all kinds of things. When you're walking through a, a field of monarda, the butter, um, insects are flying around all over the place. And that, again, 11. Is that similar to, that looks like what they call bee bulb? It is. Yes. Okay. It's the same. This is okay. the wild bee That's bulb. Okay. I mean, we've just got purple and red and yeah. all the different yeah. colors now. Okay. There are varieties. And that's the other thing about varieties. Um, if you're a little cautious about varieties, they generally aren't too bad, but you've got to be careful what they've taken out. Because um, sometimes, like with roses, they've got all these different varieties of roses. Well, a lot of them have lost their smell, mm. but they look good. So, I mean, we've got to be a little bit careful with the varieties. But generally, it's not too bad. Beatrice, one of my favorites, is it's tall, has a beautiful racine of flowers. And it likes dry spots as well. Okay, so that's the list of the ones. Those are the keystone. There's hundreds of other plants out there that you can plant that, that are not necessarily keystone, but I, I just, we can add some really bright beauty. You can get, um, for example, the, the uh, scarlet, uh, card, the lobula cardinalis, beautiful, bright red flower, gets tall and white. It doesn't support as many insects. It's not a key one, but I like to have it just because it, it blooms and it blooms for a long time and it's a brilliant bright red and gets about that tall. How tall? From the podium, make sure people know it's not from the floor. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, the other thing, in insects are attracted to clumps or to masses of much more than they are to individuals. Now, this, this is a question because if you've got a patio garden in pots um, and you can only put in uh, 10 milkweed, well, or three or five or whatever it is that you can do. Um, see if you can get your neighbor to put some in. If you can get ten from them and ten from them and ten from them, not too far apart, it's it's a pretty good mass. Then. At that point, it starts to it starts to add up, and that's the whole idea behind this home grow national park, is that we all have our little spots and we can hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of them together, close enough together that we create those environments where those insects and and other um, pollinators can. And, uh, thrive. The other thing is, if you want, if you want a monarch there, you've got to remember that a monarch larva is going to grow like eight thousand times from the size of Western egg until it gets to be about that big, mm -hmm. and it has to eat an enormous amount of food. Yeah, so a monarch larva can eat three leaves a day. Mm -hmm. So you know, if it takes them, I don't know how long it takes. Probably ten days before they can, before they go in there. So we're, they're eating thirty leaves per. So you've got to look at. How many milkweed does it take to feed one larva? Mm -hmm. you know, so you've got you to be watching to make sure that you're doing more than just one. If you want more insects, you need more plants. Oh, I'm going to go back to this one for a second. The other, the other thing is... Um, oh, the other goes up and one goes down, the other goes down. If there's too many of one, then it eats all the plants on the So they bounce. So populations are constantly going up and down. They've evolved together. They've adapted to each other. Monarch butterflies are one of the few insects that can eat milkweed. And the reason that they can make, eat milkweed... See, milkweed has a gummy sap. Have you ever had it on your fingers? Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it's really sticky, and after a few minutes, few, even a short period of time, it's really gummy. Well, what happens is an insect that's not used to eating that will bite into it, get that gummy stuff on its mandible, and then after a few minutes, it can't open its mouth anymore. Now, monarch butterflies have figured out, oh, 
if I stop the flow of the sap, I can eat it. So what they'll do is they'll go down to the base of the stem and cut off that leaf just so that the sap can't get up. Now when they eat, they can take care of that little bit of sap without it blocking up there. So they have figured out how to mechanically stop the sap from coming, coming in. So that, that's one specialization. And I thought it was really fascinating when I figured that out. I was like, wow, that, no wonder they can do it. Of course, the other thing is that they pick up all those bitternesses, all those terrible tastes that are in, in the milkweed sap, and they keep it in their bodies their whole lives. Now, normally, they would go out as a, bi as a, uh, a byproduct of, of their metabolism, but they keep it. They've got that figured out. So they have, they have evolved to be specific to milkweed. And there's many other pl plants and animals that have the same relationship. Blue counter butterflies, I don't know if you heard of those, they're an endangered species. They only grow on wild, blue wild Lupins. lupin. Thank you. Blue wild lupin. Mm. So if you want to even try and have any counter butterflies, you need to figure out how to get a whole bunch of wild blue lupin going in your yard. And I'll, and I'll just add that that's another um, reason why you might want to visit Beaver Creek Reserve near Eau Claire is that they're one of the leading, uh, probably the leading place in the country that's really brought blue carter butterflies back oh. from almost uh, being extinct by this, this method, planting blue wild lupin mm -hmm. everywhere around their reserve. And they're, um, you know, they're, they're a good example of an indigenous insect that's indigenous to Wisconsin that is the most, uh, well, after, after we're done here, We'll look up some pictures for you on our computers that we have if you want to see what blue carner butterflies yeah. look like. They're about, about that big. They're just incredibly beautiful and they're really thriving mm -hmm. at uh, Beaver Creek now because of the planting that they've been doing there. There. So, if, and the other thing is, if you, when you plant your plant, when you select your plants to plant, you might also want to think about, oh, I want to get like Luna moss or Polymephius moss. Then you need to find out what are the plants that they're attracted to and then plant those. They may not be, you know, one of the keys, so they may be something They might else. not sell them at Walmart in the, you know, in the garden area there, because they're special plants, right? Mm -hmm. they, they don't necessarily appeal to, a, to the wide um, garden market when we're thinking about just kind of feeling some color in the, on the plant porch. So mm -hmm. you, that's why it's important for you to know that you've got native plant suppliers in the area where you can find these things. Yeah, there's a list of some on, on our... There's the, the number of places where we can find out those relationships. Uh, the National Wildlife uh, and Audubon are two good sources where you can find out. Okay. One of the things that, that has come up lately is that, you know, we, we saw that in, that in that first picture with the breath repair under the lawn. Just lawn. Just right up to the trunk of the tree. What we want to do when we have our keystone trees or plants, we want to leave duff underneath. We want some of this open up uh, uh, debris from the trees to fall down and be down there. Because when the insects that live in those trees fall down, they will fall down and live either in the duff or in the ground or right around those trees. They tend not to crawl very far. So if you just have lawn there, they have no place to hide. So robins and whatever else can, can come in there and pick them off. But if they've got the duff, then they can hide it and uh, come back next year. Also, is, it's good for winter. What does um, duff mean? Oh, duff, I'm sorry. It's like just the, the twigs and leaves and uh, stuff that, that falls off the tree. Okay. So it, okay. And it, it starts to, it starts to, um, to decompose. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of a compost underneath the tree from its yeah. own stuff. Um, so, yeah, oh, and I'm planting brown cover underneath there, too. Like, like we're just talking about the strawberries, plant them around that tree. So then, when the things fall down, they got a place to hide, and then we picked off right away. Um, add some <laughs> decaying logs. Beetles love to drill into rotten logs. I've seen uh, big hornets, uh, mama hornet, uh, uh, queen hornets that are hiding in there. They pop, pop the, the log open, and all of a sudden, they're about this big in, in a log in, in March, and it was just sitting there. Too cold to fly, too, but it was, it was fascinating to see. Large large rocks. Some insects like to just hang out on large rocks and get warm. 
they or like to hide in between rocks. It's a place they can scurry off to. If something comes out, it can just screw down the side of the rock and hide. <coughs> leaf litter. Um, that, there's some caterpillars love to eat leaves, dry leaves. They will they'll finish their their larva stage by eating a bunch of dead leaves. And here, we, oh, one of the other thing, things, uh, pupation sites. At 96 percent of birds. So chickadees, a brood of chickadees, requires the parents to feed them six to nine thousand caterpillars. That's a lot of caterpillars, and that means that there's a lot of plants that have to be out there supporting those caterpillars, native plants. I mean, so you know, your your twenty plants is not going to do it. You have to have a, a larger mass that they can go to. Like the bigger, that's one of the reasons that these big trees are so important, because there's lots and lots of larvae on those trees. So you see the chickadees all the time up there, poking around, and, and then not hatches. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the other things about shelters is, is leave some open area. You've got to have, you know, we talked about leaves, brush piles are great, because they, they love to, to hang out in brush piles. They'll get into a brush pile and sit there all winter. Um, create a sandy, south-facing slope for bumblebees. The bumblebees drill holes. The, the, the mama bumblebees, the ones that are going to be queen next year, they drill a hole into a side of a sandy hill, and they'll stay in there all winter until spring. Then they come out and start their new hive as a single mom. Uh, leave open soil. Uh, it's not even for, for solitary bees. The, the picture that you see, the, these here, these aren't ants. I thought they were ants, but they're actually cellophane bees. And what they've done is they dig a hole and made a tunnel and they lay their eggs in there. The eggs hatch and pupate and they stay in the ground until the spring. So in May, they start to emerge and they'll come out and they'll do their thing and then they'll create uh, a new hive for them. And that's, that's a very common thing for uh, solitary bees in general. And then leave muddy areas. Leave some mud out. Um, wasps and bees, a lot of wasps and bees use mud make their cell walls so they you know we um, we'll talk a little later about the bee hotels but that's what mm -hmm. they use is mud um, the other thing of course is if you leave mud out butterflies love to go to mud and those in pebbly areas rather than to a creek or, or a bird feeder if they can so if you if you're the only wet spot around for several hundred yards you're gonna get a lot of butterflies coming there with, and just poking and, and getting some water out of that mud so it's another way to track them. Build cons the conservation hardscape. Set your mower high, high as you can, as long as high as you can tolerate. I like to, depending on where I am, I can see the three and a half or four inches. Um, as close to the house as three and a half, and it's in the back forty is, is four inches. It provides it provides um, sh shade, so it stays cooler and also keeps the moisture better in the ground. As well as if you don't rake things up. It provides, it, you don't have to fertilize because that the, set, the, the, the blades will break down and provide uh, a one, one fertilizer. Um, of course, we have bubblers for, my, for migrating birds. And then install a bee, oops, install a bee, install a bee hotel um, so that th those uh, solitary bees have a place to build uh, their nests. And they'll use that mud to make the, the cell walls. Reduce light pollution. This is a problem. We uh, we leave our lights on all night, and when there's hatches, you get this kind of situation happening. Now all those insects are trying to get towards that light, and they fly and they fly and they fly, and of course they never get anywhere. They get exhausted, they fall down, they die. So they never get a chance to really do what they're supposed to be doing when they're flying out like that. They don't really get a chance to reproduce because they're just trying to get to that light. So they don't spend their time mating. They spend their time to try to get out there. They're also pro prone to being picked off. I mean, what a great place to feed. You know, it's like a shark frenzy in, in, in a herring, you know. It's, it's just incredible. Now, the easiest thing to do um, if, if you, is to put up motion sensors and then use yellow LED lights. So there's less of, they are less attracted to that. Mm -hmm. The motion sensor, of course, so it only comes on when you actually need it. It's not on all the time. Of course, the perennial, do not use herbicides, pesticides, or synthetic fertilizer. And you absolutely have to. Um, 
Once you have your native plants, you don't eat them because they'll take care of themselves. That's the beauty of this. Of course, with pesticides and herbicides, they run off, they get into our water, and all the usual. Um, some of them have um, hormonal effects on native plants or native animals as well. Alligators being born from rapidite, weird stuff. Um, and the other thing is 40% of the chemicals that we use on our lawns are banned in other countries. So one of the things that, that we really got to think about is like, are these things really any good, really that good? I mean, do we need to have the perfect everything? I don't think we do. <laughs> not, not with the risks that we have. There are natural solutions, and lots of places you can go to find natural, uh, natural solutions for, the, for pesticide, herbicides, and, and fertilizer, compost, and lots of different things. Okay, network with your neighbors. This is, this is really where it becomes what we are doing here. We're networking. We want to get started on a conversation about who is good. Can we do something together? Can we decide that maybe you want to plant a certain kind of plant, I want to plant a certain kind of plant, maybe we put them close next to each other so that we can complement each other, um, how far away they, how far away it could be, how to make, all of the things that happen when there is a collective and you start to cooperate together, all the good things that happen. Um, one of the places to go and see is the Homegrown National Parks website. It's on your, it's in our sheet too. Um, and when you get, when you get, uh, there's lots of information on how to network and the suggested ideas. And number ten, educate your neighbor. That's the outreach part of what we're doing. You go to um, the Monarch projects have really caused a lot of excitement and, um, and a lot of interest and knowledge. People are interested very much in what's going on. So it's really given us an opening to continue this, to, to extend what they started there and move it into the realm of we're going to do this not just for monarchs, we're going to do this for many more other things that we can, that we can, uh, that we can start to get that diversity and sustainability back. Um, lobbying local government, changing the, uh, the laws. You know, in Minneapolis now, you can you can have these wild gardens. They used to be you could not. It would be fine. Say all these weeds. It's like they're not weeds. They're part of my garden. Um, and as uh, as Israel mentioned, the uh, Great River Road is 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 uh, looking to add native pollinator plants plantings all along the Great River Road in Wisconsin. So we're working on that project. Um, schoolyards are a great place where we have school kids, you know, go out and plant these things and look after them. One of the things that happens is people will go and plant something and never go back again. And there does need to be a certain amount of how's it doing kind of thing to check to see what's going on. Um, and so, let's see, uh, well, that's it. So, so now we're going to go back into your yard. You're going to look and say, oh, I'd like to turn this hundred square feet into something. What do what we'll fit here? When you plant your garden, it's just like any other garden. What's the moisture? What's the soil? What's the shade? How tall is it? When does it bloom? All the usual things. You know, what do I need to do to prepare the soil? Can horses all... tolerate it? You know, yeah. Yeah. Do you have animals? They have to be considered with all these things. It's, it's exactly the same thing. And that information is so readily available now, as it was, it did not used to be. So, I think it's well ended. And I have to do one, one more thing. I wanted to. We can take questions for you. Yeah. The, uh, I want to, I to I, I, this is, I really like this quote from, from uh, Doug Colony. And uh, addressing exactly this issue. In the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. Now, they have to support life. Sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. So we are all doing something, and we all can make a difference. So thank you. And we are now open for questions. Oh, you want to do a summary? Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So, ooh, I did it. Any questions? Do you know if the extension office here in the county offers where you can get the wildflower mix? Because I know a friend of mine that's on the Minnesota side, she said from Dakota County she was able to go into the extension office and order 
you know, pollinator type plants. I'm just wondering if our extension office that offers is, that, that. That is a real good question. I, I don't know for, uh, for, Pierce, for Pierce County. County. Okay. That, this would be, Prescott would be in Pierce County. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what Pierce County does. I know Papin County is looking at it now because okay. we've been talking with Papin County about it and it would just make so much sense for you to talk sure. with those folks, especially yeah. if you know them and encourage them to work with Israel and with other people here. So that that's one more source of plant seeds locally. Step 10, right there. Right, Step yeah. 10. They already <laughs> ordered there. Yeah, there you go. Step you 10. Know. Well, so. mm -hmm. And they do have access in the county uh, extension mm -hmm. offices to so many resources that mm -hmm. we as uh, stewards of plants can can really use. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of times they like to be asked so that they become more visible to people as a resource. Yeah, my neighbor's so. kind of done this already. Around the perimeter of their pole barn, it's right. all wildflowers. Beautiful. Yeah. And my that... husband and I want to do it too. I mean, for a good reason, and also so we don't have so much lawn. Absolutely. <laughs> and with the price of gas going up, it's a great time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we could call these victory gardens, I think. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yes. So another resource yes. is um, there's the Kinnick Native. Um, we should add that. Yeah, yeah. he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. He's just a fantastic yeah, guy, Wayne. Uh, it, could you say that so everybody can hear it? Uh, Kenny, is it Kenny or Kinnick Native? Kinnick Native. Oh, okay. Is it 65 towards Roberts? Okay, Wait. 65 towards Roberts. Yeah, we can add that the right to this. Hand side. And then we'll, um, if there's anything else anybody thinks of that you want us to add to this resource list, you have a copy of it now, but then when we mail out your, um, your PowerPoint, we can add the updated resource list to include that. That item and anything else you think of today. Yeah, we last year we went and got a bunch of native plants from Good. Kinnick and yeah. put them in and trying different things and yeah, we've got to move stuff around and find the best place for them. And Absolutely. I love what York said about how they move themselves sometimes. <laughs> that sounds so funny, doesn't it, when you think of plants moving? Mm -hmm. But um, these plants, when you think of the thousands of years of um, co-evolving that they've done with insects, that, uh, you know, the, the miracle of DNA uh, evolution over tens of thousands of years with these plants and insects, that they are so smart, they have so much built-in intelligence, you, you might say. That if it's too wet, that they'll uh, they'll they'll find a little bit drier spot, and they'll take off there. It's pretty amazing to watch it happen. So I'm in a I'm in a new development just around up down the road, and um, I was working with the, the landscaper, and according to them, it's just so easy to put down the lawn. You know, we'll just it is easy put to it put down. It's down. cheapest sure. for the homeowner. It, it is really easy to put a lawn and down. And it's easy to maintain. Yep. So, and I've been, you know, trying to figure out now how do I, you know, like, how do I, how do I do it? I don't want the lawn. Right. And, uh, right. you know, like I started out, like, it's all going to be pollinators. But then, you know, like, it, you know, yeah. it just kind of evolves, like, oh, okay, half of it's going to be lawn. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any rules, do you know, of in Wisconsin that says you have to, add, like, you can't just do flowers or, or... Well, the first place to start is, do you have a homeowners association right. then, an yeah. HOA? We don't. Sort of. There is a covenant, but there's um, no organization. Okay. Well, usually people, I'd love to hear what you have to say, but just let me just say this, and then you please jump in. Um, every, every home is situated in, in, in a neighborhood or in a development, and, or like where we live. We, we live in the country, There's we're on our own. We've got 12 acres, no, it's up to us what we plant there. Unless Pepin County says something about it, they, they don't, where we live. But you, you do have to know those things about what, where you're starting. And that's why some people do start with pots, and do start with a deck full of um, native plants, and do practice learning what works and what doesn't in, a, in, in that way. I mean, there's no wrong way to start. And one of the things you'll find when you uh, start to explore these sites that we were mentioning is that there's good information available there. And then, um, in your case, you live in Pierce County. Um, Pierce County Extension, I would talk to them because they are kind of the go-to people, I think, in a lot of 
the counties around here, they've done more work with many different kinds of situations, whether it's farming or gardening or whatever we're doing, they tend to know what's going on and have some institutional memory sure. about how people have handled different things in Pierce County or Pepin County. I mean, if you have a local garden club, and we do mention in here several different garden, uh, garden I say, native plant associations, because there are quite a few different ones underway right now. Some are focusing on prairies, some are focusing on water plants, people focus on different things. But um, the, the more local, the better. I mean, you, you have some neighbors here from Pierce County that can probably uh, help. You can maybe meet each other, and maybe Israel would, would help us facilitate a way where we could gather together and talk to each other and just kind of create our own network for after today, because why not? Why not do that? But please, would you offer what you wanted to say? Well, I want, I actually have two comments. One, we have a new Pierce County Extension agent okay. who would love for us to contact him. Oh, I'm isn't sure. that wonderful? Yeah, yeah. Right. So um, I would encourage people to get information from the Extension Department. And then um, we, we do will have add that to the resources. I could talk to that person. Yeah. And then we could add that. So help me figure that out afterwards, please. Okay. And then we there are city ordinances, but we've taken a lot of the plants off of the species that you're not allowed to have because I think that was a mistake, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but the only ordinance that I can think of is how high your grass is left sure. to be. Sure. So that is where the city gets involved. Is. Right. Well, it's mm -hmm. good to know that because every, every community has their own, mm -hmm. uh, their own practices mm -hmm. and their own concerns. So best to know those right away. And maybe there's something to add here about Prescott as well, as well as Pierce County. Mm -hmm. Prescott's uh, interpretation of what they want to see. So that's pretty much Quite open a book at the moment. Okay. <laughs> that's good. Well, yeah, that's great because then you can start to change. Did you yeah. develop right. the way you want? Or do you want yeah. to call on people? Because I can't yes. see. I was just going to say that there's also there's a difference if you live in the city of Prescott and if you live well, in Oak Grove Township right. or if you live in you know what I mean the townships. The townships. Yep. Yep. All have their own rules mm -hmm. and ordinances or not mm -hmm. rules. Or not. Like so it's. Yeah. It's interesting how it can depend on right where you live, what you yeah. share. Within so. zip codes, there could be differences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Based on the township lines. Yeah. 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 So how do you get started on this if you already have one, right? Mm -hmm. So do you, I mean, can you just, do you have to dig that part that you want to start up? Um, My husband and I tried to do this last year, but then the guy that mows our grass mowed over our seeds. <laughs> so, do you have to take some grass out and start it? What we've often done is we've used cardboard for mulching. Um, we really like cardboard for mulching um, to put it down where you want to start planting. Okay. In as many layers as you can get cardboard. Okay. And let the grass die underneath the cardboard. Okay. Because then you don't have to use any poisons on your land. Sure. Uh -huh. And you can really let Mother Nature do the work for you. Um, so really does that take? Uh, yeah. no, it, 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 it doesn't take that long, just, uh -huh. just a few weeks. So if you put it down like early in the spring, as soon yeah. as you can. By, uh -huh. you know, after four or five, six weeks, it's done. You can pull the grass off. I mean, there might, there might still be some seeds that come up. Yeah, um, I might have to keep those. If you want it to be perfect. But the other thing about cardboard is, and a number of places have done this. They put the cardboard down, and it stays down, and then you just cut out a hole where you want to plant something. Mm -hmm. And the reason yeah. that, that that really is a, a good thing, you don't have to lift it, you don't have to worry about other things coming up, because it's going to stay there. The, the other part of that is the cardboard breaks down. Right. And then it becomes just part of the fertilizer. It also keeps the moisture down, mm -hmm. keeps the moisture in. Once it's wet, it goes down, and then it doesn't come back up again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cardboard down, and then... Hose, what the cover? Yeah, hose and yeah. 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 dirt on it to keep it down, put yeah. rocks on it. Because sure. um, anything that, anything organic that you want there, that's in okay. it, just let it break down. Mm -hmm. there, use it. There's a bee lawn seed mixture that the University of Minnesota created that you can seed over your existing lawn. Wow. I get that. That's good that's to know. We'll, we'll check into that. What is that called? Bee lawn? 
Beelon seed mix. Okay, thank you. B E E. Yeah, it's the University of Minnesota. I'll check it out. Yeah. And I just heard a routine this morning. I was listening to another webinar, and what they suggested is to mow your lawn as short as you can in area, the area that you want to plant some prairie. Mow it as short as you can. Put your seeds down. Mm -hmm. But then over the next two to three years, mow it as high as you can. Yeah. Yeah, that's and great. then that's after that, the uh, plant should really be good. growing because it takes a while for those mm -hmm. native seeds to get established. Mm -hmm. Yeah, natives, a lot of native seeds, I've been helping out with the DNR, doing some of the state natural earlier. And we collect seeds and do brush clearing and stuff. And one of the things, they, they said they're going to be doing seeding this year. And they said they don't expect a lot of those forbs to come up. The grass will come up right, right away this year. And do it in May. Is it about the forbs will come up till next year or later? Because a lot of these seeds have a long dormant period. So, and, all, and also they might require a burn to to uh, kick them out, get them kicked out. One of the things um, that you did last year here, Israel, that we participated in that was so great was uh, uh, Israel and his and his crew here did um, seed collecting with from some of the native gardens that they have out here, which are really great demonstration gardens. If you when you start seeing the plants coming up, you'll want to come over and take a look at them. Um, and then they did this uh, class, which, which was on Facebook, on winter seed sowing, using uh, recycled milk cartons um, and as your seeding um, location, and then putting them out in the winter and the snow, letting, letting these native seeds go through the various um, treatments that they need from cold and wet and warm. Because again, if these plants and these seeds are from this area, you know that that is how they are accustomed to growing. They go through cold, they go through wet, they go through heat, they go through all kinds of things. So when we started, we, we, we did really try to um, think strategically about small areas and buying plants for those small areas from reliable native plant sources so we could have some instant gratification with the plants. <laughs> because. I am all for gathering seeds and building up over time with seeds, but um, you know it takes longer. Um, if you want to, I think it's on here. But if any, have any of you been to Kinstone near Fountain City? Kinstone. 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 Uh, the woman that that owns and runs Kinstone. Uh, it's a one-woman operation. She does this on her own. Christine Beck is her name, and she has she started a native prayer there six years ago. So we've been going there every year, and every year is it more and more of it evolves. Some of the plants on that prairie, it's taken them six years to really uh, come into their own. So when you're doing those kinds of native plant projects, you know your timeline is is a long one. And if you're in a situation where you are the only person in the neighborhood doing this, and everybody else has a lawn that looks like that one on side one. Um, you know, you you have to be aware of the fact you want to get a certain amount of uh, support from your neighbors. You don't want to, even if you could go with your entire acreage the first year, you you might want to get to know those plants better and start small and build build um, out from there. Gorilla planting. Gorilla <laughs> planting. Yeah, I love it. Throwing seeds. That's in the right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Yeah. Just before people even know it, they've fallen in love with it. They don't even realize it's made of plants here. Okay, so um, I don't know if, if, um, if I, we, we're going to be here. It's five after three. We're going to stick around. Uh, did you want to say wrap up for us, Israel? We will, but Jorg, I, Jorg is going to wrap up and then I'll wrap up here okay. and then stick around. I mean, some of you were expecting to stay till four. So, hey, stay till four. We just uh, ended up ending a little earlier here. Uh, but I do want to be respectful of your time. You did not uh, uh, change this to 3 o'clock at any time. Jorg is going to wrap up, and then I'll wrap up with a couple of comments. Did we get a few okay, there? We have two oh, awesome. correct answers. Oh, wow. the, what, what was the correct answer? The to, how many, of, what's the number of 380 mean? Well, the, the insects. The insects attracted to the willow. To the willow. Correct. Correct. Okay. Now, remember, daylilies are zero. That, that's terrible. <laughs> They're pretty, and but they'll take over. They just stop. I mean, we've got a hundred thousand daylilies in our yard. I'm digging yeah. to get them out. So yeah. that's why I found them at the compost site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. that was us. Yeah, it's not a good sign. <laughs> when you got ten thousand daylilies. <laughs>
<laughs> so yeah, there's two correct right. answers, and I'm going to have you pick one. Okay. Oh. There we go. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and the winner is Bonnie Burkman. Oh, oh yes. The other, the other person was Vicki Rudolph. Very good. Very good. Oh, way to go, Vicki. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming. We're going to stick around for a as long as you want to ask questions. Or, that's, that's the wrap-up, right? Yep, Thank you. that's the wrap-up. Well, you. I'll be the official last wrap-up. So nice. Don't put your coats on yet. Uh, but can we just say thank you to York and Kathy? They donated their time to uh, help us turn our yards into a collective national park. And so this is really, really cool. And I do want to recognize Kathy Oss, who is here, right here. Uh, and you can hear her talking in a recorded uh, experience. This, uh, this webinar that we did, this workshop we did last year, is on our YouTube channel, okay? So if you want to see how to plant the seeds and you want to learn more about what uh, we have here in our gardens at Freedom Park, Kathy is on there telling you she's an expert. She's the one who, who designed these gardens and uh, if you are here in Prescott, we'd love to talk to you about helping us with our gardens. Oh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I go check that out on our YouTube page and the Great River Road Visitor and Learning Center. Just look, punch that in YouTube. You can also see some cool drone shots of what I was talking about before of the goats. Uh, the uh, unfortunately we only had the after shots of the drone from the uh, from the goats, but pretty fun. Uh, and also we did want to let you know there's a whole bunch of stuff up here. Uh, including some, uh, you know, some pamphlets, grab some, these are, this is Be a Friend of Pollinators, uh, put out by the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture. Um, you can grab that for some resources. Uh, you can come check out this special uh, bottle of honey that is, I don't believe, for sale, but uh, York, yeah, do you yours. sell this? It's, yes, I do, but it's yours. So York sells this, okay, this is made right. You can talk to him about where to buy some of his honey that uh, is specially made from all of his pollinators. We have a bunch of books that York has up here as uh, samples, and also I want you guys to take all these because we have extra uh, seeds from our gardens, okay? Uh, and so uh, take these, and they have some instructions on how to get these seeds to Germany, okay? So you should we should have all of that doo -doo -doo right here available for you, um, and some planting instructions. If you want to grab some of those seeds, take the planting instructions, grab a little packet or two or three. I want to get all those seeds gone, so feel free, take a few, okay? And then uh, you can go check out how to do that and watch us guiding you through that process. If you need a little help on how to do that, you can watch us on that YouTube channel. And I would just like to say, I've done that for three years here, and of course last year it was virtual, but I currently have 24 jugs in a snowbank. With oh, multiple different seeds. Wow. Them. So thank you for doing oh, that here. Wow. That's thank you so awesome. Much for us together. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Glad. Right. Yeah, yeah thank that's you. super fun. So uh, check it out. And also, um, other things that you might be of interest coming up uh, the Star Watch with Mike Lynch. We also have, uh, uh, there's. This is the newsletter that you were supposed to get, but there's a nice, I just printed out a couple pages for you. Mm -hmm. So you can check this out. Voice of the Confluence was supposed to happen last week. We postponed that due to weather, so you have a chance if you want to experience the power of native drums, April 9, that's going to be at the high school, at the high school performing arts center. We're not going to be able to do that in here. Um, we're expecting hopefully several hundred people at the high school. So uh, come be part of that if you want and grab some more information. Um, and stick around for questions. So thank you everybody for coming, being part of this, and welcome to Freedom Park for those of you who are here for the first time.